Okay, welcome everybody to uh, uh, part three, I think, of our series now. And uh, I just want to thank and uh, dedicate the sheer Debbie Sondheim, who's a good longtime friend uh, of Torah Motion, comes to so many classes, uh, participates. Uh, it's really wonderful to have her as part of our community is dedicating today's shear in memory of the her husband, her late husband. Today's the, his fifth yard site. Um, and Fred Distenfeld. And uh, I remember when we first did our series 24 and 8 uh, on, on Tanakh, that's when I think you, you sponsored one of the shearing back then. And that's when we got to know you. And I really want to uh, thank you for your participation. Thank you for your sponsorship. And you should have good memories. And uh, we should all be merit of long life and uh, good, good, uh, happy things to celebrate okay thank you very much and surely it's all yours all right i will also add my thank yous that's a beautiful way to remember somebody um okay so let's get started uh today we are in a place that i i can't say that i've you know checked it out completely but i would say that jerusalem probably has more synagogues per capita uh, than anywhere else in the world um and really it's it's incredible certainly in certain neighborhoods like in Nachlaod, you can't walk like three steps without coming across another big knesset so we're going to focus on Jerusalem today, uh, but on all different kinds of elements of Jerusalem. Obviously, we are not going to get to all the Batek Knesset. It is not possible. Um, and we're going to focus on a few different things. Um, Jerusalem has ancient synagogues. It has modern synagogues. We're not really going to go any more ancient uh, than going back to the Middle Ages. We're not talking about the Batei Knesset uh, of, uh, of Roman times, of Byzantine times, for the very simple reason that Jews were not living in Jerusalem after the Bar Kokhba revolt. So we don't have what we saw last week, the, the richness of Batei Knesset from those time periods, from 1,500, 2,000 years ago in Yerushalayim. But we do have many, many from medieval and modern times. Um, and some of them were off limits from many years because of uh, the divided city between 48 and 67. What you're looking at here is the beautiful reconstruction and renewal of one of the four Spartic synagogues. This is the Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai synagogue. We're going to come back to it. Um, which was horribly desecrated in the War of Independence by the Jordanians and has been renewed and made very beautiful. Um, and uh, we have a, a lot of different themes that we're going to be talking about today. So first of all, because Jerusalem is the home to so many different kinds of communities, I thought this was a good place for us to talk about um, differences in nuschaot, in tunes, in customs, because as all of us know, you can go into a Beit Knesset and have a basic idea what's going on if it's not your nusach, but a lot of the sounds will be unfamiliar, the words will be unfamiliar, right? We have certain things that are obviously the same, like things that come from, from the Torah, like Shema, uh, or Shemona Esrei is mostly the same, but we definitely have variations in poetry, in tunes, in customs. So we're going to take a look at that a little bit today uh, in the context of all the different diverse diaspora communities that are represented in Jerusalem. Um, we're also going to take a look at the prayer for the government, since if we're looking at all these diaspora communities that have can come home, right? Kibbutz Galuyot. But at one point, they were in the diaspora and uh, and they prayed for the peace of their government. So we'll take a look at that as well. Um, we're gonna look in depth at the Italian synagogue uh, and uh, actually really two, Ital two different Italian stories, um, as well as a few of the synagogues in Nachlaot. Synagogue as the anchor of the community. Uh, and we're going to finish up with the Jewish quarter before and after 1967. How do you preserve and rebuild the synagogues of the past? So we've got a lot to do. So let's get started. Okay, so this is something that came up uh, last week, two weeks ago. I don't remember somebody suggested it uh, and talked about uh, a Beit Knesset that is it a Beit Knesset as in a place of Kinus, right? Is it a place where we come together, whether it is to learn or to make community decisions or a place where guests stay, or is it a place of prayer, right? And we know that certainly in the in the early days of Bate Knesset, there was a distinction between places in the diaspora, which had the Greek name of a prosuch, okay, which is a place of prayer, whereas in Eretz Israel it was a Beit Knesset, a, a kinos, a place of ingathering. Um, 
Now, the Gemara, very interestingly, we discussed this two weeks ago, the question of when do these ideas of a synagogue begin, right? When do we first have these places that are places for prayer, for study, et cetera, et cetera, instead of or even alongside the Beit HaMikdash? Uh, the Gemara doesn't have to ask those questions. The Gemara knows the answer, right? When does it happen? According to the Gemara, it happens right after Churban by Rishon, right after the destruction of the first temple. And we have a few really fascinating sources here. So let's just take a look at them, right? This is the Gemara in Megillah, which talks a lot about Bate Knesset. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says, come and see how beloved the Jewish people are before the Holy One, blessed be he. Every place they were exiled, the divine presence went with them, which is really a very audacious statement, right? To say that the people, the Jews are exiled from Israel and the Shekhinah, God's presence is also exiled. Isn't God everywhere? Yes, but God comes along with the Jewish people wherever they may go. And the Gemara goes through many different things. I didn't bring you everything. Um, and it asks, where in Babylonia does the divine presence reside, right? Remember Babylon after Eretz Israel, or sometimes more than Eretz Israel, was the most important uh, diaspora community in the times of the Gemara. Where is God's presence in Babylonia? Abaya said in the ancient synagogue of Hotzal and in the synagogue that was destroyed and rebuilt in Nahar Da'a, the, the Hebrew, and we're going to see it on the bottom in the Egeret of Rav Shira Gaon, uh, Chef Viyativ de Neharda. Chef Viyativ sat, uh, went and sat, or went and settled. Here it's uh, translated as destroyed and rebuilt. We'll come back to it. The verse states, I have been to them as a little sanctuary, right? A mikdash me'at. Um, and that's from Yechezkel. What is that talking about? Rabbi Yitzchak said, this is referring to the synagogues and study halls in Babylonia. Rabbi Elazar said, this is referring to the house of our master, i.e. Rav, right? Rav is the, one of the most important and certainly one of the earliest Amoraim in Babylonia, from which Torah issues forth to the whole world. Okay, so we're going to see when did this Chef Yativ get founded, but it is right at the end of this period of the first temple, according to the Gemara, according to the Midrash and the Egeret of Rav Shira Gaon. Already at that point, the Jews need, have a need for a place to come together in Chutzaret, in the diaspora. And so they create a Beit Knesset. But even though we have these places that are wholly outside of the land of Israel, you have this fabulous statement that we're going to see actually comes true for some synagogues uh, in the modern times. Rabbi Elazar Kapar says, in the future, the synagogues and the study halls of Babylonia will be transported and reestablished in Eretz Israel, as is short, stated truly as Tabor among the mountains and like Carmel by the sea, so shall he come. So at one point, we're not going to need these places in the Galut, in the in the exile, and they're going to be brought back to Eretz Israel. So don't forget that. Remember that Gemara, whoever is not muted, please mute yourself. Um, did I unshare? How did I do that? Sorry. Um, Rabbi Kalman, you un you disabled I, I just, me. I just made myself host new co-host so I can take care of the people who are talking. So I oh, will okay. Oh, now I see. Sorry. Now it's back. Yeah, yeah, Sorry. Yeah. So it's back. Yes, I can mute people now. <laughs> okay. All right. So we'll remember that the synagogues can be transported and brought to Eretz Israel because we're going to come back to that. But let's go back to this synagogue in Nehar right? Shef Yativ that was destroyed and rebuilt. So Rav Shira Gaon, relying on the Gemara, I didn't bring you all the details from the Gemara, but he expresses it very beautifully. Um, Rav Shira Gaon in the 10th century, right, writes a letter talking about Jewish history. Right, if you were in the, the class that we did on Tanakh, we talked about how there were two stages to the Babylonian exile. The earlier one is called the Galut of Acharash Haba Mazger in the time of King Yehoyachin or Yechonia, 597, right? So then they are exiled with some prophets, i.e. Yechazkel. Uh, they went to Naharda'a, which of course is some perhaps somewhat anachronistic because Naharda'a is one of the, where the great yeshivot, where one of the great yeshivot of Barvel is 
place, but it's many, many years later, right? But Rav Shira wants to give it earlier antecedents. Ubanu Yehonya Melech Yehuda V'siyato Beiknishta, and the king, right? Yehoyachin, Yehonya, same guy, and his uh, assistants, they built a Beikneset in Naharda, V'yasduha, V'avanim, U'ba'afar Sheheviu Imahim Mibet HaMikdash, right? It's a, it's a fabulous Midrash that they use the stones and the dirt that were brought from the temple. They knew the temple was going to be destroyed. It had not been destroyed yet, but they could see what was going to happen, and they wanted to create, and, and, and literally, it's a Mikdash Ma'at. It's a small sanctuary. L'kayem aleim Right, we have a, a, a verse that talks about how the people took the stones and the dirt, right? And what did they call this Beknesset? Right, what well, we said, destroyed and rebuilt. Klomar, Shanasa Beta Mikdash, Nasa, Shaf, Vyashav Khan. The, the temple picked itself up as if Ki'ilu, right, Kivyacho, and moved to here. So we have this idea of the of the Batei Mikdash already beginning with the time of the Khurban and becoming a, a way to continue the temple. Obviously, not completely, right? That's what we talked about in the first class. There's no sacrifices. There's no altar. Um, even though we do hear in uh, in Egypt that there was such a thing, there was a, a, another Mikdash, Mikdash Chonyo. But in general, we're talking about places that are meant for prayer, that are meant for study. That's what's going on here. Okay. Um, and of course, this spreads to the rest of the diaspora. Now, one of the things that's, that's so strange uh, is, um, and we'll, we'll see this as we go on, um, Judaism is uh, unity without uniformity, to use a popular catchphrase, right? We have certain things that are very basic, that are the same for us, right? That we that we pray three times a day, that we have the same Torah, that we you know, that that we believe in the same God, that we have Shabbat. But there are variations wherever you might go, and yet we are able to remain one people with these variations. And probably the strongest uh, iteration. Of this is Ashkenazim and Sfaradim and, and the differences in their in their liturgy. Um, now all of this ultimately stems from the divergence between Eretz Israel, right, the Jews of Palestine, and Babylonia. The Jews of Eretz Israel, the Jews of Babylonia developed different ways of praying. So obviously, certain things remain basic and the same. Shema, the Amida prayer. Right, but other things, the order of certain prayers, uh, many of the piyutim, right, of the poetry, of the keynote, uh, and even some blessings, right? We, we even have in the Nusach of, uh, of the land of Israel, we have the idea that you say Birkat mitzvah on Kriyat Shema, which I don't think any community does anymore, but Asher Kirishanim Sotavet Sivanu Likro Kriyat Shema, right, which is a, a very strange thing. It makes sense, but it's not something that, that we do anymore. Now, probably the, the deepest root of this is, um, is in the Torah reading, right? The main difference, at least early on, was that there was a three-year cycle of Torah reading versus the one-year cycle that we're familiar with, okay? Uh, in Eretz Israel, they read the Torah over the course of three years, uh, and in Bavel and other parts of the diaspora, they read it over the course of one year. By the time of the Gaonim, we seem to be on the same page, even though we're not always on the same page. You guys are going to be reading Parsha Shlach this week. We are going to be reading Parsha Korach. So it doesn't always work, but mostly we are on a one-year cycle. But that's a very basic difference that, that ends about a thousand years ago. But other differences continue just to kind of give a, a larger picture of this divergence, right? The countries that follow the Eretz Yisrael liturgy Big Adol, uh, Italy, the Balkans, Ashkenaz, meaning Jews of Germany, uh, the Romanio Jews, okay, the, the, the Greek Jews, the Jews that follow the Babylonian liturgy, Spartan, right, Spartan and Yemenites. There are some liturgies that don't fit 100%, right, the Jews of Persia, the Jews of Aleppo, okay, oh, some conservatives do three years, that's interesting, I did not know that, that's kind of neat. The three-year cycle is a very interesting idea, which obviously means, of course, that Simchat Torah is a, is a relatively new holiday, right, that, that's also something to keep in mind. Um, but 
these lit liturgical divergences still exist and they really stem from the differences between the land of Israel and Babylonia and, and it's one of these things that that has carried on even if things like the Torah reading uh, have not changed um, okay let's continue um, so let's focus, we're going to focus on a few different communities. One of the very interesting communities to focus on is Italian Jews, okay? Um, we'll talk about the Italian Jewish community or the many Italian Jewish communities is more proper to say because it's not one community uh, in a moment, but let's first talk about a place that's a very beautiful place in Jerusalem. If you've ever been to the Italian synagogue on Rechov Hillel, it, it's phenomenally beautiful. Uh, it, it's a very interesting story to the outside building, okay? Uh, as you can see, this is at the end of, uh, well, not the end, but towards the, the end of Rehov Hillel, uh, next to what today is called the Music Square and the Chalat Shiva. So you have this building, which was not built by the Italians, and it was not built as a synagogue. It was actually built by German Catholics okay, in the 1870s. Um, the Germans, like many other Christian groups, are feeling very cramped uh, in the old city in the 19th century, and they're looking to move outside and to build churches, uh, schools, hospitals, uh, hostels for their pilgrims to come and stay. Uh, and the Germans built, built a compound that they call the Schmidt compound uh, here at what eventually becomes Rehov Hillel. There's nothing there in the 1870s. Um, Ultimately, they see that this is not a great place for them. It's it's too far west. It's not close to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which everybody wants to be close to. Uh, it's not close to the Christian quarter, uh, and they don't stay. They move to uh, Shrem Road to Derach Shrem, which is much more convenient for them. Uh, and this building is taken over by various Jewish organizations. It's a school, a Maale school, um, and, and we're going to see that it eventually is used by the Italians. But before we move on, just inside on the first floor, there's this beautiful ceiling, a decorated ceiling that's still from when this was a German building. Uh, this was a dining room with these very, very gorgeous decorations, not open to the public unless you know somebody who will open the door for you. Um, but it's, it's an interesting vestige of this building. Now, um, this Beit Knesset, right? Uh, we'll talk about how the Italian Beit Knesset come to Jerusalem in general, but, um, but first a little bit about the Italian community. Right? There are Italian Jews who come little by little to Jerusalem. By the 1940s, they are praying together as a community. Um, and they're borrowing various places to do that. They don't want to say that they are the Italian community or that they're praying according to Minhag Italia. Why not? Because this is the 1940s and the British are in charge and the Italians are enemies, right? The Italians are ruled by Mussolini. They're part of the Axis. They don't want to, the Italian Jews in Jerusalem don't want to associate themselves with that both because they, they find it distasteful and also because they don't want to get in trouble with the British. So instead, they call themselves Minhag Bnei Roma, okay? um, which is actually a very old Minhag, the Jews of Rome. And you can see this is a machzor from 1391, right over here on the right. Um, Machzor Minhag Bnei Roma, because the, the Roman Jews are a very, very, very old community. However, the Minhag Bnei Roma in Jerusalem is much more of a, a hodgepodge of a bunch of different Italian nuschaot. It's not purely the Roman nuscha, um, uh, but um, but they they borrow a whole bunch of different things. Now, this is a Beit Knesset that was brought here into Jerusalem in 1951. Uh, and at the time, in 1951, this synagogue, which is from the very early 18th century, it actually was started in the 17th century, this was the oldest synagogue in Jerusalem. How can I say such a thing when you have medieval synagogues in the, in the old city? Because the old city was under Jordanian control. So in 1951, this Italian synagogue was actually the oldest synagogue in Israeli-controlled Jerusalem, which is fascinating. Now, what's the story here? Okay, um, 
the Conegli this is called the Conegliano Veneto Synagogue. It's from Northern Italy. It's a place between uh, Padua and Venice. It was first built in the 16th century, okay, uh, in the 17th century. And this is the second version of it in 1701. Um, and it's a beautiful ornate synagogue, okay, which was a little bit shrunk when it was brought to Jerusalem, meaning it is the original synagogue, much of it, some parts were, were rebuilt, but it's not the original proportions of the synagogue. It, it, it was made smaller to fit into the space that they have. Uh, this is the Aron Kodesh, it's incredibly beautiful uh, Aron Kodesh dedicated to the rabbi of the synagogue, whose name was Rav Natan Otolenghi. Um, and uh, this Beit Knesset is part of the story of the Italian Jews and the reason why there are so many Italian Bate Knesset or really accessories of Bate Knesset that were able to be brought to Jerusalem. And the story is like this. While in places like Germany or Poland, the Nazis invaded, the synagogues had been in use up until World War II. And then people were murdered, the synagogues were destroyed. But in Italy, it was a little bit of a different story. Already by the end of World War I, by the 1920s, Italian Jews are leaving their small towns. They're small towns that have these beautiful, beautiful synagogues, but it's hard to make a living. They're moving to the bigger cities. Some of them are making their way to the land of Israel. Some of them are making their way to America. And these Bate Knesset are kind of abandoned, right? They're not destroyed, they're intact. And in many cases, even the communities are not destroyed, meaning the people are not destroyed, the communities kind of disband. Um, and, and they're still around when the Italian community of Jerusalem decides to have them make Aliyah. I'm going to tell that story in a moment. Um, but um, just to understand this, this Beit Knesset of Conegliano Veneto it was last used as far as we know. We actually have an amazing photograph of it. They have it in the synagogue uh, on Yom Kippur of 1918, okay, when there were Jewish soldiers who came here and they wanted to have a Yom Kippur service and they used the Beit Knesset. But after that, it really wasn't used. So it wasn't destroyed, but it was abandoned. It wasn't used. Um, it's in the design of a lot of Italian Bate Knesset, which is that they are bipolar. This is not a psychological reference. This is talking about how the Bima is on one end, right? And, and the Aron is on the other end. And that's meant for good acoustics. It's meant for good singing. We're going to get back to the Italians and music and how important it is for them. But let's diverse, diverge for a minute and just talk, uh, digress for a minute and talk for a minute about Italian Jewry. Okay, um, the Italian Jewish community, parts of it are very, very old. Uh, parts of it are relatively new. Okay, the community really begins in Rome already in Hasmonean times, meaning we already hear about Judah Maccabee going to Rome and there being a Jew Jewish community there. So second century before the common era. Um, the community grows quite a lot after the destruction of the second temple because the Romans capture many Jews, bring them to Italy, bring them to Rome. They know the Jews are crazy and they'll actually pay high ransoms to free Jewish prisoners. And that's exactly what happens. And they pray, they do pidyon shfuyim. They pay to free the prisoners, to free the Jews. And those Jews become part of the Roman Jewish community. And it's a very old community. Um, we have catacombs under the city of Rome. We have catacombs for non-Jews, but we have for Jews as well. Uh, and this is an inscription from one of them, as you can see uh, in a uh, in nice Greek letter right, but with a menorah showing us that this is a Jewish community. Now, as time passes, the Jewish community expands to other places as well. And here's where you have a very interesting uh, issue with Italy, which is unlike other countries, uh, Italy remains very decentralized for a very long time. It's not one country. It's not Italy, right? There's Rome and there's Venice and there's Milan and there's, uh, and there's Sicily and there's Naples. And each one is its own city state. And what that means is that there's not one policy relating to Jews, okay? And when a city allows Jews in, so the Jews come usually because they're brought in uh, for commerce, for money lending. And then, you know, a friend brings chaver, maybe chaver, as we say in Hebrew. One friend brings another, Landschaft, right? We, we bring in more and more people and the communities grow. Um, and these communities have different rules for different places. So there could be places where the Inquisition was ruling in the Middle Ages and there could be places where Jews could live freely. Um, 
There were places where Jews had a lot of freedom. In these northern communities, particularly in the Renaissance, you have some exceedingly wealthy Jews, right? Uh, not wealthy on the, on the level of the, the Duke of Gonzaga, for example, right? But they're a little wealthy, right? They're a smaller version of wealthy. And they do the same kinds of things that their non-Jewish counterparts do. They have a lot of intellectual curiosity. They become patrons of the arts. Okay? Uh, they take part in all kinds of crafts, textiles, embroideries, metal, but also in music and theater, things that we don't hear about so much uh, in other countries. Um, and it goes in the other direction as well, right? A lot of Christians are fascinated by Jewish studies and start studying Hebrew and studying Bible. So you have this very interesting back and forth. It doesn't mean that the Jews are not considered second-class citizens as they always were in the Christian world, but they did have a lot of freedom and they created a lot of incredibly beautiful culture. Some of it very similar to the cultures that uh, the Christians were creating and the art and the music that the Christians are creating. So two uh, fascinating examples from these medieval Italian communities. One of them is uh, somebody named Leone or Arie Modena, um, 1571 to 1648, uh, who lives also in Northern Italy, mostly in Venice. Uh, on the one hand, he is an incredibly brilliant man. He speaks all kinds of languages. He's the first Jew to really write an autobiography. He writes poetry. He's a musician. Uh, he writes about music. He writes about how the Jews should not have music that's worse than the Christians. Why should we, who had the Livyim and the Beit HaMikdash, why should we, as he puts it, now sound like donkeys braying? Right. So on the one hand, he's a brilliant man. He's a brilliant scholar. On the other hand, he has a lot of, um, shall we say, more modern problems. Okay. He's a gambler. He has a compulsive gambling habit. Okay? Uh, and he writes about this. It's not, I, I'm not revealing any secrets here. Uh, he has a compulsive gambling habit. He has a son who is killed from various experiments that he does in alchemy. Right? He gets himself in a lot of trouble, but he's a fascinating individual who's a great example of this kind of give and take of the Italian community that, that, that happens in the Renaissance. Okay? The other person person that uh, I would talk about here is uh, somebody named Solomone di Rossi. Um, and this in the middle here, you can see it says, Ashirim Asher li Shlomo. Shlomo is Solomone di Rossi. This is the early 17th century in Mantua. This is the, the Aron Kodesh of the Beit Knesset of Mantua. You can see the incredible, incredible uh, you know, uh, richness of the carvings here. Um, now he is a composer and a singer, and he has a band, and he is the court musician for the court of Gonzaga, for this very, very wealthy Christian patron, okay? But he also writes Jewish music, which sounds a lot like Renaissance Christian music. He writes a musical version of Shira Shirim. He writes a, a, a tune for Al Naharot Bavel, right? So he's very deeply in this Jewish world, but very much in the larger cultural world, musical world. So it's, it, it's a fascinating combination. And this time period is, is just a very, very interesting one if you're interested in the intersection between Jewish culture and general culture. Um, Okay, but let's talk about the Aliyah of the synagogues. Um, so what happens is like this. Um, already, and here we have uh, the synagogue uh, in, uh, well, on the right here is the synagogue that's in the Israel Museum. Uh, and on the left, this is the Rinanim synagogue that we're gonna talk about in a minute. Um, already in the late 1940s, the idea hatches in the brains of the uh, Jewish Italian community, particularly in the leader of the community, Shlomo Umberto Nachon, um, to have the Bate Knesset make Aliyah, right? It's, it's always a very sad thing when a community leaves behind a synagogue and there's nobody to pray in it. But in this case, it's not completely sad. The community is not destroyed. The community is relocated. The community is in the land of Israel. Uh, and the suggestion is, well, let's bring the Bate Knesset and the synagogue furniture to be with us in the land of Israel. And that's what they do. So they bring two complete Bate Knesset. Okay? One is the one that we saw, Conegliano Veneto, which is used as a regular Bate Knesset. It's prayed in every Shabbat. There's a community that, it's, that, that supports it. Okay? The other one was brought to the Israel Museum. Okay? Uh, 
uh, as part of what they call the synagogue group, where they have synagogues from all different parts of the diaspora. But the goal really was not to create museum pieces. The goal was to have these put into real living synagogues. Uh, and they were, right? We're going to see some of them end up in uh, the rebuilt Jewish quarter, but not only, okay? We have an Aron Kodesh in the Yeshiva in Panovich in Bnei Brak. Eh? We have an Aron Kodesh from Italy in the Knesset synagogue, uh, in the Malcha Mall synagogue, right? Uh, in the Rinanim synagogue, which is in Hechal Shlomo. And that's where we have this beautiful letter Okay, uh, which I'm going to read to you, which was obviously not written in English, but it was written in Italian um, from the head of the Jewish community um, who wrote this letter as the, as the Beit Knesset was, as the, as the Aaron and the Bima were being brought, were making Aliyah from Padua, if I remember correctly. Right? And this is the letter that he wrote to the captain. Your ship will soon be carrying, yes, the holy ark of the great synagogue of Padua. We are sadly parting from these holy objects because for many generations, they were witness to everything in our community, both happy and sad events. But we are comforted by the fact that these objects are intended for synagogues in the land of Israel. Transferring these objects more than it is a symbol of the dismantling of our congregation is a symbol of the renewal of our national life. It is this aliyah that each one of us is commanded to do to strengthen the coming generations. Michelangelo Romanin Yakur, it's a great name, right, in 1956. So you have this idea that the Batekneset are making Aliyah as well. The Italian Jewish community, especially the Roman Jewish community, very, very connected to the land of Israel. And in fact, we have a famous photograph uh, that on uh, when the state of Israel is declared, right, um, the Jews of Rome march out through the Arch of Titus, march in the direction, the opposite direction uh, from where you are supposed to go, like away from Rome, showing that they are no longer enslaved in Rome, but they are able to return to the land of Israel. So you have this very beautiful idea. Okay, let's, uh, now that we're firmly ensconced in the exile, uh, let's talk a little bit about prayers for the welfare of the state, okay? Um, Already in the book of Jeremiah, right, uh, your meow writes a letter. This is before the temple is destroyed. This is when we have this, like we, we say split screen, right? Where you have some of the community is still in Jerusalem, but some of the community has already been brought to Babylonia. And like we saw before, has already established a big Knesset there, according to the Gemara. Uh, and your meow writes him a letter and he says, don't expect that you're coming home anytime soon. It's not happening so fast. And he gives them some instructions, build houses, have children, earn a living, bedir shu, Et shlom ha'ir hasher higleti et chem shama vit palu ba'adal adonai ki b'shloma iyelachem shalom. Seek the welfare of the city to which I have exiled you, and pray the Lord in its behalf. For in its prosperity you shall prosper. Uh, and Jews took this literally, uh, and wherever they were in the diaspora, they said some sort of a variation on a prayer for the state, right? A prayer for the leadership. Now, some of them are kind of absurd. And, and I know we all remember from Fiddler on the Roof, right? What's the prayer that you say for the czar, right? God bless the czar and keep him far away from us, right? And, and, and the idea that we're praying for people like, if you look here on the left, right? You're praying for Wilhelm Hasheni and Augusta Victoria, right? Kaiser Wilhelm, who was a, a horrible anti-Semite, Right, and his wife Augusta Victoria Yarum Hodo, or even more, it's Fila Baad Adonenu Hakesar, right? Alexander Alexandre Veich, and Maria Tederas Banya, right? This, this seems a little bit crazy. However, we know that Jews, whether they like the leadership or not, were at the mercy of the leaders uh, in the diaspora, wherever they may have been. Uh, and praying for them was, if not necessarily heartfelt, at least politically correct and, and a smart idea. Um, and, and of course, this continues in many places, including in the United States, and I'm sure in Canada as well. Uh, and I brought you a few more, uh, slightly more sympathetic to the Jews, although not much more, right? Um, we have here some British ones, right, on the left here, right? That's the, the classic beginning. Our sovereign lady, Queen Victoria, 
Albert Edward, Prince of Wales, Princess of Wales, and all the royal family, right? And it's actually a very beautiful prayer because it clearly, while we are mentioning the local, you know, uh, earthly rulers, we are very much emphasizing who gives them that power. Hanoten chualam lachim or melech machem lachim, right? Don't think just because you're the king or you're the Prince of Wales, you're not really the leader. There really is one true king and he is the only king. So yes, we're gonna mention your name too, but understand that you are secondary to the real king, right? And over here on the right, this is from a, uh, a synagogue uh, in Brighton, uh, in the in the UK. And again, King George, our gracious Queen Elizabeth, Mary, the Queen Mother, the Princess Elizabeth, right? So the Queen Mother here of today, our the Queen Mother today is the Queen Elizabeth, the Princess Elizabeth is Queen Elizabeth of today, right? But this is definitely done throughout uh, in the land of Israel, of course, since independence, we now have a tefillah l'shalom ha-medina, this beautiful prayer composed by uh, the chief rabbi, Rabbi Herzog, who we're going to see in another minute, picture of him, uh, and with the help of Shai Agnon, um, um, and there are many synagogues that say both, right, in the diaspora that will say the tefillah, but will also say the prayer for the state of Israel. Um, okay, we're going to take a little bit of a dive into some of the communities uh, in Nachlaot and some of the Batei Knesset. Many of you are familiar with Nachlaot. Nachlaot is the, the many neighborhoods. It's not one neighborhood. It's often mistakenly thought of as one neighborhood. It's actually 32 distinct neighborhoods that are in the area behind Shuk Machane Yehuda in Jerusalem. And, and this is really the type of place where you can literally walk from one synagogue to another without even like catching a breath. You, you just have them right, right next to each other. Um, and many of them are tiny, right? There are some synagogues that the alleyway outside the synagogue is the, is the women's you know, section, um, but some of them are big and beautiful, and we're going to take a look at a few interesting ones. So one of them is the story of the community of Chaleb, or Aram Tsova, or as it's called in English, Aleppo. Okay? Um, and as you can see outside, this is the great synagogue Ades of the glorious Aleppo community. Okay. Um, the Chaleb community or the, the Aleppo community is a very ancient community. They date themselves going back to Yoav, David's general, right? Because it talks about Yoav going and conquering the areas of Aram Tsova. And they believe that their great synagogue in Aleppo uh, was the, the, the foundation stones were laid by Yoav, right? By Yoav ben Sruya. Whether it's really that old or not, it definitely is a community that goes way, way back the Syrian community goes back certainly to the time of the Tanaim and the Amoraim, even if it may not go all the way back to biblical times. Um, the Aleppo Jews spread out to all different places. Um, they come to Jerusalem, a community comes to Jerusalem in the late 19th century. Uh, the family that builds the synagogue, the Adas family builds this gorgeous synagogue with these decorations, these mother of pearl decorations that are brought from Damascus. It's very much in the style of, uh, of the, the uh, Syrian communities uh, in Syria. Um, the most famous thing to come out of Aram Tsova is the, Ket, the Keter, or what's known in English as the Aleppo Codex, which is a story in and of itself. It's a very long and fascinating story. If you're interested in it, there's a great book about it by Mati Friedman, but we'll just tell uh, the, the short version, right? Uh, people who were in the class that we did about medieval history, we talked about the masteries in Tveria in the Middle Ages, people who uh, came up with the idea of vowelization, of notes for the Torah, um, and they were the ones who considered to be the most authoritative in terms of the text of how you write the Torah and then he could. Um, and this was a not a Sefer Torah, but a book, right? A codex, a Tanakh that was written in Tiberius. It was commissioned uh, uh, by a uh, very wealthy, we're not sure who, we think it might be a Karite, but commissioned from the Bar Asher family, these very, very well-known Masoretes in Tveria to create this perfect copy of the Tanakh. It was brought to Jerusalem when the Crusaders captured Jerusalem, they captured this book as well. Uh, and they know, again, just like the Jews are crazy to ransom people, they're even crazier and they'll ransom books. Uh, and this book was ransomed and brought to Egypt 
We know that Maimonides, the Rambam, uses it. He writes that he refers to it when he writes his own copy of a Sefer Torah. Somehow, we don't really know how, it ends up in Aleppo. It ends up in Aram Tova, in the great synagogue here. Uh, and that's what you're seeing here. This is the synagogue. Uh, what its fate is today is, is a very important and sad question. It's probably not doing very well. People who live in Israel, there's an amazing exhibit. I haven't seen it yet, but it just opened in the Israel Museum, uh, a virtual reality of being in the great synagogue of Aleppo based on photographs that were taken in 1947. Um, but essentially what happens is that it's hidden here. It's kept in the synagogue essentially in the basement. It's rarely taken out. Uh, and with the the partition plan voted on the UN in 1947. There are riots uh, against the Jews. Uh, some of the synagogue is destroyed. It seems some of the Keter is destroyed or stolen. And only 10 years later, does some of it make its way to the land of Israel? It's a very interesting mystery story. We will not go further into it right now. But inside the Beit Knesset, besides these gorgeous mother of pearl decorations, you also have very, very beautiful paintings on the wall that were just restored recently. Um, they were actually done by, uh, uh, sometimes we say this as like a metaphor. In this case, it's really true. He really was a starving artist. This was a guy named Yaakov Struk, uh, who was a very promising young artist in the very new art school of Bitsalel, right, 1913. He's commissioned by the synagogue to make these wall paintings based on the tribes. Uh, very ornate, very beautiful. He does it for free because like so many artists, he says, ah, oh, it's good for the exposure, right? Uh, but he he really doesn't have any money. And in the terrible disasters that take place uh, in the beginnings of World War One, he dies of typhus. Uh, and the only thing we have from him are these beautiful paintings. Um, the story about the paintings is that he made all the tribes with different symbols, right? And the symbol of Dan is a snake. Right, Dan, he's a snake min habashan. He's a snake coming down from the bashan. Uh, and when they restored the the paintings, they did not put in the snake because the legend is that a pregnant woman saw the snake and she was so frightened that she miscarried. So the the snake is not put back in. Today, the the great synagogue of Ades is the place where, first of all, uh, the slichot. Right? We know that Spartan begins Slichot, the beginning of Elul, just one of the many differences between Spartan and Ashkenazim. And the first like official Slichot is in the Ades synagogue. It's actually televised. It's a big deal. Uh, in the wintertime, they do what's called Shivat HaBakashot on Friday nights. They, they get up very, very, very early Shabbat morning, like two or three o'clock in the morning. And they sing these beautiful Piyutim before Shacharit. Uh, and, and it's a very much a fixture of the neighborhood. Um, not too far from Ades is a much, much smaller synagogue that has a very interesting story to it. Uh, and this is the Beit Knesset of Yanina. Yanina is Jews who are called Romaniot Jews. These are the Greek Jews. They originally come from the land of Israel um, and they have their own Nusach. They're following the land of Israel. They're from the time of the Byzantines. They're praying in the same way. What happens to them? What happens to them is that with the expulsion from Spain, Greece and the Ottoman Empire are inundated by huge waves of Spanish Jews. And the Spanish Jews get there and they say, it's very nice that you pray this way, but you know, we're the Sparadim Tahorim. We're, we are the Spanish Jews. Our, our Nusach is obviously the correct one. So we're just going to take over and we're going to pray the way that we pray. And you can forget about praying the way that you pray. Uh, and uh, just to put it rather harshly, um, and there is very little that survived from these this Romaniot Jewish custom. Um, in the early 20th century, there were about 4,000 Jews in, uh, in Yanina. They spoke Greek. They even kept that three-year Torah cycle for a while. Um, but those 4,000, the last little remnants of this ancient tradition, almost completely destroyed in the Holocaust. We know that the Greek Jews uh, were, were very decimated in the Holocaust. Um, but there were some who had left before. Uh, and you can see this Beit Knesset was 
made in 1925, Tafresh Pehei. They made it to the land of Israel early. They had another big Knesset also in the Christian quarter, which doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and there's another one over here on the right on the Lower East Side. And this is one of the few places that hold on to this very old Romaniot Nusach that most places do not use anymore. Um, Okay, let's move. We'll come back to our um, to our edot, but let's talk for a minute about a, a very well known structure next to another very well known structure, the Great Synagogue, which is set back from the street here on King George Street. But preceding it, uh, built already in 1958, is this building over here, which people often confuse the two, uh, and that's called Hechal Shlomo. Okay? And the idea was to build it in order to have a place for the chief rabbinate. Today, the chief rabbinate has been moved to the edge of the city to Romema, but this was the plan. It was really um, articulated by this very uh, imposing look and gentleman here, uh, Rav Yitzchak Kalevi Herzog, who is the great grandfather of today's president of Israel. Um, and his study is in the beautiful museum that's inside of Hechal Shlomo. Um, the Great Synagogue is only built more than two decades later in 1982. Um, inside Hechal Shlomo, you have this Rinanim Synagogue that we, we saw before, right? The Ark that was brought here from Padua, uh, all kinds of beautiful stained glass windows. And there's also a, a museum uh, on the top floor, which has just been renewed, people who live in Israel, very worth seeing. Uh, focus is on all different kinds of artifacts connected to prayer, to community. There's also some very bizarre dioramas of Jewish history, but I just put the picture in for fun. Uh, but there's also um, Rav Herzog's study. Uh, and I'll just tell you the story of this Talit, because it's just a great uh, it's a great story. If you can see what it says, it says a talit shesarda, the talit that survived. Uh, it survived. It's it was owned by someone named David Ben David. It survived three different destructions. Right when the synagogue was burnt, the synagogue in Europe where he prayed was destroyed in the Shoah and the Holocaust. The talit survived. He came on Aliyah to Israel on the ship Patria, which was sunk. He and the Talit survived. Obviously, it's always him, but he writes about the Talit. And finally, he went to Kfar Zion, which was destroyed by the Jordanians in 1948. And yet, David ben David and his Talit survived and continued. Um, OK, let's take a look at, uh, at the Jewish Quarter for a little bit. Um, so the Jewish quarter situation before 1948, you had many, many, many synagogues, okay? Some of them very impressive, many of them tiny and really not insignificant, but certainly didn't look like much of anything. Um, and this is a great photograph from 1940, from before 1948, where you can see um, the Horva synagogue. I hope I'm doing this right. Yes, here's the Horva. Uh, and you can see the Tiferet Yisrael synagogue, which I think is here, but I could be wrong. Okay. Um, and when the Jordanians conquer in 1948, one of the things they do to show that they are in charge is that they blow up very spectacularly these large synagogues like the Horva, like the Tiferet Yisrael. Um, and uh, for 19 years, I, the, these places are completely destroyed. Nobody goes to them. Nobody can use them. Jews can't come into the old city. Uh, a synagogue that wasn't destroyed, the physical structure wasn't destroyed, but was desecrated, is uh, the four Sephardic synagogues. Okay, these are uh, these are fascinating synagogues. You can see pictures here from before forty-eight. Um, the Jews prayed for many years in the synagogue that's called the Ramban synagogue, but in the 15th century, uh, they are kicked out because a mosque is built right next door. Uh, and they slowly but surely, the Jews who lived in the Jewish quarter in the 16th, 17th century, build a complex of four different synagogues connected, eventually connected to each other. Okay, the most important Sephardic synagogue in Jerusalem before 1948 is this one, is the Rabban Yochanan Ben Zakai synagogue. Um, it's the first one that was built here. And it's definitely the most impressive one. Uh, why Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai? Because it, the tradition is that he sat here when the Beit HaMikdash is still standing 2,000 years ago, and this is where he studied. 
eh, tradition, a legend, we don't know, but the synagogue got named after him. Now, these batekeset were not destroyed. The structure was not destroyed. And that's purely because they are underground. Okay? And in fact, in 1948, this was a miklat. This was a shelter for the Jews who were left in the Jewish quarter as the battles are raging around them and they're losing building after building, position after position, they gather in these four Sephardic synagogues in those last few days before the Jordanians completely conquer. And this is like a bomb shelter. Uh, and that's why they're not destroyed because it wouldn't be spectacular to destroy them. It doesn't look like anything to blow them up because they're all below ground. Instead, they were just desecrated. Now just to, to just, it's not such a, such a just, but that's what it was. Now, this is after they were restored. When they were restored, you can see it looks pretty much the same, right? Um, they restored not only the Aron Kodesh and everything else, but they added in, they put in something that had been here before 1948. If you look, this is a window that is very high up. You can't see it in this picture, but it's basically up here, okay? And if you look carefully, you can see that on the windowsill is a shofar, and a jug, okay? it's a jug of oil. Why? The tradition is that when Elijah the prophet is gonna come and announce that the Mashiach is here, where is he gonna go first? He's gonna come to this big Knesset, right? Rabbi, and it's a very beautiful idea, right? Because Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai is the one who has to leave the city as the city is being destroyed. And he manages to carry on Judaism in Yavna, right? Give me Yavna and her sages. And when Elijah is gonna come and the Messiah is gonna come back, he's gonna stop first in the Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai synagogue. So if he comes, we wanna be ready. We need to have the shofar. We need to have the oil so that he can blow the shofar and tell us that Mashiach is coming. He can anoint Mashiach with the oil. Perfect, beautiful. Okay. Uh, meanwhile, next door is the Eliyahu Hanavi synagogue, right? So he could go to his own synagogue. Um, and um, there are all kinds of legends, as there always are, uh, about things connected to Eliyahu Hanavi. Why is it called Eliyahu Hanavi? Because they were nine men waiting for a tenth to come etc. Right? The two other synagogues, one is called the Istanbuli because it was created by a community of Turkish Jews. And the fourth one, which is my favorite name, is called the Emtsai. It's the in-between. It's just a little Beit Knesset between the others. So it got called the Emtsai, the in-between Beit Knesset. Um, now, as we said, 1948, uh, this is the, the final shelter for the Jews before they surrender. Um, you have to understand the terror that Jews felt this end of May, 1948. They really did not know what was going to happen to them, what their fate was going to be when the Jordanians conquered the city. Only two weeks earlier, the Jordanians had conquered Gush Etzion and had taken out all the Jews who were there and massacred them. So the Jews really did not know what was going to happen. Thank God that's not what happens in the Jewish quarter. There's just a surrender. The men are taken as prisoners of war. The women and children are sent to the new city. But in those last few days, the Jews don't know what's going to happen. And they actually, we have testimony that they open up the Aron Kodesh uh, in the Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai synagogue. They hold their children and they say Shema because they really don't know what's going to be. Um, after that, when the Jews are, are spared, the, the Beit Knesset is not. Uh, as you can see, it's basically turned into stables. It, it's, it's a very terrible desecration of the Batei Knesset. Um, and then the question is, after the Six-Day War, what should we do? What should we do with the Jewish quarter? Should it become uh, a museum? Should it become a living space? Should it become an archeological excavation? It basically becomes all those things. Um, but the, the goal was always to bring life back to the synagogues, to rebuild them. Uh, and some of it was rebuilt with the help of these Italian Aronot Kodesh, Bimot, right? That are brought here and that are installed in these four Batei Knesset. Now, a, a different story is the story of the Churva. This is not rebuilt after the Six Day War. And many of us have in our photo albums at home, this iconic image of the arch of the Churva, right? That after the Six Day War, the idea was we should rebuild this very important synagogue. Um, but nobody could agree, they, should they build it the way it was? Should they build a new design? There was even a very famous American architect named Louis Kahn who, uh, was commissioned to create a new design, but nobody agreed on anything. And the only thing they put up was this arch, right? Um, the name Chorva doesn't come from 1948. The name Chorva comes from 
the early story of the Chorva uh, when it was uh, it was built by uh, followers of Rabbi Yehuda HaChasid, Rabbi Judah the Chassid, a Polish Jew. Uh, many people say he was a secret follower of Shabtai Tzvi. He comes with his followers in the early 1700s. They borrow money. Um, there are very few Ashkenazi Jews in Jerusalem at this early part of the 18th century. They borrow money, they build a building, Rabbi Huda Hasid dies a few days after he arrives. His Hasidim can't pay back the money. They default on the loan. Uh, and the Arab money lender comes to them and says, you can't pay the money, get out of the city. And they, and they have to leave the city and the, the synagogue is destroyed. And only many years later, right, over a hundred years later, when the students of the Vilna Gaon come back, right, particularly with Shlomo Zaman Soref, right, who you can see is uh, on his tombstone, very proudly, it says he is Goel HaChorva, right? He comes and he and others pay back the debt, uh, get permission from the Turks and build this very, very fabulous, beautiful synagogue. It becomes the main uh, Misnagdish, right? Ashkenazim who are not Hasidish synagogue in Jerusalem. Uh, it's the biggest, it's the most impressive. Uh, everybody who's anybody comes here, right? Uh, Rav Shmuel Salant, the chief rabbi of Jerusalem for many years, uh, lives nearby. Um, Rav Cook is ordained as the chief rabbi here in 1921, when Herbert Samuel, right, the first high commissioner of Palestine under the British, who happens to be a Jew, and even a Jew who's a little bit literate in Judaism, uh, when he first comes to Jerusalem as the high commissioner, he is invited to, to the Chorva on his first Shabbat in Jerusalem, which happens to be Shabbat Nachamu, right? Shabbat Nachamu, and he comes and he gets called up for the Haftorah to read Nachamu, Nachamu Ami is a very, very powerful moment. Okay? So it's a very, very significant place when word starts to come to filter from Europe about the disasters of the Holocaust. They gather in the Chorva to pray. Many, many things happen in the Chorva, uh, uh, but then it's destroyed. And then the decision is made in the early 2000s. Some money comes in from some Ukrainian Jewish businessmen to rebuild. Of course, they have to excavate underneath. And since we're in the heart of the Jewish quarter, what do we find underneath? We find part of a main street near the Cardo. We find mikvaot, right? We, they even found a, um, a slick, a hidden place for weapons from 1948. But the Beit Knesset is rebuilt um, in uh, 2010. It's dedicated and very, very beautiful ending of the story. The person who comes to uh, the dedication is the person who was the president of Israel at the time, Ruby Rivlin, whose great great grandfather was one of the students of the Vilna Gaon who had come and who had redeemed the land and built it in the first place. So it's this very beautiful closing of the circle uh, in uh, in Yerushalayim in the Chorva synagogue, which of course today is both a working synagogue, uh, it has a kolel that learns in it, and it's also a site that people can come and see as tourists. So it has all those different pieces to it. Next week, we will take a sneak peek. We will take a look at Tzfat, which is also a great center of Bate Knesset, uh, and take a look a little bit at a different angle on prayer and praying in places that are not necessarily a synagogue. All right, I see there are many comments here. Let's take a look at them. Ay, ay, ay. Let's go back to the beginning. Uh, right, conservative three-year cycle, right, very interesting. Susanna says, I know the man whose father was instrumental in bringing the synagogue, right? Uh, uh, Shlomo Nachon, right? Is that who you're talking about, Susanna? Um, the person that I knew, his name was, um, uh, his last name was Dishon. I'm trying to remember his first name. He was, uh, I believe, a, um, a microbiologist in the Hadassah Dental School. And oh, his interesting. Father, his father was one of those soldiers. Um, uh-huh. And uh, so the story that he told was that you know his father was in this company of soldiers in World War during or after World War One. They were in Italy. It was Rosh Hashanah time. They wanted uh, a place to pray. They went to the, the local priest to ask about a synagogue. He said, you know, there's somebody in my there's somebody in town who's not in my parish, so maybe she's Jewish. And he <laughs> threw them to, to her, and she had the she had the key to the synagogue and uh -huh. uh, and let them use it for for Rosh Hashanah services. 
And it was after that that they made arrangements, you know, with consultation with the locals about taking it board by board from Italy to. to That's Israel. amazing. I never heard that part about the soldier. I knew that they prayed there. I'd seen the pictures, but I never heard that part. Thank you. That's so interesting. All right. Let's see. A beautiful big Knesset. Yes. Uh, not great for the women's section. What can I tell you? Until Italian unification, many Italians could not move to larger cities. Ah, thank you. That's very helpful to explain the context. Thank you. Um, the Ezra Nashim used to be behind the women's, the men's section, not upstairs. Okay. If you want to see the beautiful, oh, Rabbi Kalman has given a nice advertisement here. If you want to see the beautiful shuls of Italy in person, room for two more people, journey through Jewish history to Italy. Okay. See, Good. You didn't talk about the beautiful shul in Florence, which is where we are over Shabbos. But that, ah, anyway. okay. Because yeah. it didn't come to Israel. It stayed in Florence. Yes, I, I only yes. stay in Israel. I gotcha. I gotcha. Well, what about Italy, the, what about okay. the the Ferret Israel, the Bach Synagogue. The, the, the Tiferet Israel is being rebuilt. It is almost completed, at least from the outside. <laughs> I don't so know exciting. what the inside is. Uh, Jay, Jay, uh, Rabbi Kelman? Yes, yes. That's the Yushatana's, uh, you know, Tiferet Israel was is originally. Right, Hoshatan, yeah. We, Rochelle and I are cousins, and the, we come from the Hoshatana. Hoshatner Hasidim, the son of, of the Rishon Rebbe. But okay, we can talk about that afterwards. Thank you. Okay, uh, Yes, it's being back, rebuilt. Back. So when you come on the Torah in motion tour to Israel, Correct. hopefully it will be ready by we then. We haven't announced that Russell yet. came but... from a family of Levy harp players. Yeah. Okay, Italian Jews. I'm not going into this. It's interesting though. The Ark at HUC is also from Italy. I did not know that. Thank you. That's also very interesting. Um, Anarchy is worse. Yes, definitely. Um, after Mussolini, the Italian Jewish community stopped saying a prayer for the government. I did not know that. That makes sense. Um, ah, the Middle Street Synagogue in Brighton. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Drew it toward Greece. This is I, Rabbi Kalman. I should get a kickback here for all the. Uh, the, the well, we'll see how many people sign up. that you know, I brought give, here. Give you a kickback. You know? <laughs> so, We'll, we'll invite you on one of the trips. That'll be the kickback. That would be good. Okay. Um, my aunt survived the sinking kickbacks, of the patria from Yossi. Yossi, you have to tell me about that. Um, okay. It looks to be above ground. It's not. You actually have to descend steps to get to it. If you come to the Jewish Quarter, you see it really is underground. It has light. It has natural light because there's a courtyard, but it, you do have to go down to the ground. Um Okay, some were sent to well in West Jerusalem. Where is the Ezrat Nashim in the Chorva? It's up on the top. It's it's actually you get a beautiful view from the Ezrat Nashim because you see the whole the whole uh, you know height of the Aron. What was the oldest synagogue in Alexandria? I do not know. Rabbi Kalman, do you know? Oldest synagogue in Alexandria? I don't know, but I assume the one in the Gemara, the Gemara talks about the shul in Alexandria where they had to wave the flag, the famous shul. You know, it was so big that people couldn't hear Amen. But so is that, it still um, standing? I, I assume, I don't know. I, I, I we haven't done a trip to Egypt yet, so I'm sorry. I don't know, uh, you know, but... Uh, Ruth says, ask Malka Simkowicz about uh, Alexandria. Okay, yes, that's, that's your correct. Homework. That's correct. Thank you, Ruth, for reminding us. Yes. And she probably All go right. back. She, she she spoke about it. She gave a talk on the Jews of Alexandria. I can uh, go on our website, just like type it in, and you'll see she she did that. Okay. Is Chorva related to? Yes, it Chorva means it's Mechrav. It was destroyed, and because it was destroyed already in the 18th century, the problem is most people think it's Chorva because it was destroyed in 1948. That's the second Chorva. It was destroyed already before in the 1720s. Okay, I think that's it for questions and comments. Yeah, Thank no, you very that, much. that's exactly what I think what the uh, Hosea said, parim when, when there was not a, 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 a Beit Mikdash and there was not a Korbanot, then we needed a synagogue. So that's what even Hosea said when he said, That's true. Parim. So you're saying it goes back earlier than your Miao, even. Huh, maybe. Oh. Okay, any other questions, comments? Otherwise, we'll thank you again. Truly, of course, I haven't been here live for a while. I've been tied up, as you know, but it's nice to come live every once in a while. So thank you very much, personally, and on behalf of uh, 
everybody. Really, thank you. Yesha Koach. And uh, tonight, as I mentioned, after Dr. Lasker's talk, tonight at 8.30, uh, as I mentioned, truly, I'll say this old jokes, you know, I'm sorry. Like, uh, we have a 8.30 tonight, Rabbi Aaron Greenberg on Parsha Shlach Lecha. We do it so you don't have to worry that it's the wrong Parsha. 3.30 in the morning, nobody from Israel is coming. Okay, but uh, 3 th 8.30 p.m. tonight, Eastern Time, Rabbi Aaron Greenberg, head of JLIC here in Toronto, will be giving the Parsha Shear to Mormon. Please God, my Shear, continue Shear in the Sitter, 9.35. Rabbi Lee Tag at 11.15 on Sunday. Monday, Mark Shapiro has his last class for the summer because he's going to be in Italy uh, for the next couple weeks. And after Italy, we have our Portugal trip. You didn't talk about any shuls in Portugal, so I didn't post anything about Portugal. We're doing, please God, our inaugural trip, which was supposed to go in 2020, but uh, obviously it did not. And uh, hopefully that trip will be going in mid-July. Um, and uh, people ask about oh, Greece, other trips, please go out. And uh, as Shuli mentioned, please go. We're going to have a trip to Israel, but I don't want to talk too soon. And uh, but uh, we'll keep you posted as uh, you know as we work out any details. But uh, have have Shuli lead. You know, it's nice online, but uh, online is not the same as in person, especially if the tour. So, Bakasha, <laughs> please God, in the not too distant future. Okay, everybody. Then we have all our regular classes during the week. We look forward to learning with you. Uh, please invite a friend and everybody have a wonderful day. Enjoy the nice weather. You know, we're in June, June. I always get a little depressed on June 21st because the days are getting sh shorter. I get happy on December 21st. The days are getting longer, although it's much nicer on Jan June 21st in December. But anyways, okay, everybody. We still have a, hopefully a beautiful, safe, healthy, wonderful summer and a summer of continued learning and uh, all good things. And we look forward to seeing you in the near future. Okay, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Thank oh, you. you love my joke. Please. Oh, my gosh. Please. Okay, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, the, yeah. By the way, tour in motion has nothing to do with our trips. We had tour in motion for about eight years before we went on any trips. But yeah, that's good. Pe people do make that association. But uh, we started, we're actually coming to our 20th anniversary. But uh, tour in motion got started. Then we started our first trip in 2000. In 11 to Central Europe, where uh, where Mark Shapiro called me up and uh, said, "How would I like to help organize a trip?" And the rest is history, as we say. And thank God we've run well over 20 trips, and uh, they really are are wonderful. If uh, you can go, and uh, I know they're not inexpensive, but uh, they're five star trips and five star learning, and uh, only for people interested in Jewish history. If you want to go to Greek to the Greek islands, don't come with us. But if you want to go to Greece to learn about Jewish history, where the you know. That's something really worthwhile seeing. Okay. Anyways, uh, thank you, everybody. And thank you very time. much. Thank okay, you. Okay. Thank you. Thank Take you. Care. We haven't, uh, we did do one trip to India with Ari Zivotofsky. Yes, we did. And we did a trip to Africa with Rabbi Slifkin. And we did a trip to Poland with Shalom Berger. So uh, we've had, uh, but Mark Shapiro does most of our trips. But uh, anyways, a few summer, we'll see us uh, as things go. Okay, everybody be well. Thank you. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.